Good morning, everybody. My name is Karsten Ma. I am director of the Institute of AI for Health at the Helmholtz Center in Munich. And it's um, a great pleasure for me to chair um, another iteration of this amazing uh, virtual lecture series of the Single Cell Omics Network Germany. Um, it's a rainy Friday morning, but it's good to see so many of you um, coming back here again. Um, we had a last minute change of speakers um, and it, it's great to have Malte here um, jumping in and telling us today uh, something about his recent work on harmonizing single cell atlas data. Um, a very brief introduction. So Malte is um, the postdoc team leader at uh, Institute of Computational Biology at the Helmholtz Center. He studied physics um, in uh, Warwick, UK. Um, continued doing his PhD in Oxford, then worked a year for a pharmaceutical company in Belgium um, before coming back to um, research and starting as a postdoctoral researcher in uh, Fabian's machine learning group here at the ICB. He contributed substantially to um, single cell efforts, in particular in data um, harmonization and uh, pre-processing and analysis. And I guess that's what he's going to show us. Um, and uh, Malte was really a substantial and super important part here at um, Helmholtz in particular, when Fabian um, was not that present in the last month during his parental leave. Um, and looking forward to see what's next for Malte. And um, thanks a lot for giving us this talk today, Malte. Malte? I guess yeah, so I start or did you want to introduce the upcoming? Ah, sorry, yeah, we could, I thought we do it at the end, but we can also do it now. Um, so um, keep in mind, uh, this is of course not the last lecture. We continue on November 5th with um, Adrian Granada from Berlin, how proliferation cell cycle dynamics affect the responses of single cells to chemotherapy. Um, so we'll be back in, this is in two weeks, I guess, right? Uh, right, but um, now today let's, let's, switch to Malte as usual. Um, there are on the bottom of your Zoom panel, um, the reactions, please raise your hand at the end of the talk or give me a cue in the chat um, and then I will call you after the talk. Ideally unmute and turn your video on so we have a nice um, interactive discussion feel at the end. I guess that's it for the housekeeping, right? Thanks Marco and Adin and I guess, yeah, now Malte. Up to you sharing. Thanks a lot. Like 30 minutes talk and then we have roughly 10 minutes of discussion. I think I need to quickly change over. Uh, perfect. Thanks a lot for the uh, the kind introduction, Kasten. Uh, making me sound very grand. That was uh, very cool. Um, and uh, also thanks for the opportunity to, to give a talk uh, at this kind of last minute um, time. But uh, I think it's it's really fun to have such a cool audience. Um, my name is, is Malte uh, Lucan, as, as Carsten already mentioned. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, integrating uh, diverse data sets. If you're interested in anything that uh, I talk about today, please don't hesitate to get in touch uh, through any of the uh, social media uh, that I'm kind of linking to the, the bottom left here, um, or just you know anything else that you, that you find me on, I, I'll happy to respond. Um, I guess in this forum, I don't really have to introduce single cell genomics, but I you know, will anyway at, at the uh, expense of just probably repeating what everyone knows already. So um, while bulk genomics has often been likened to a smoothie, in single cell genomics, we can inspect every individual parts of this smoothie. Uh, and therefore, uh, in the going back to the genomics, um, can give a detailed description of, of cellular state. This has been enabled to uh, at a very high throughput meth, um, level via the introduction of droplet-based sequencing methods, where we can isolate cells in a droplet at a very, very high pace and therefore get data sets, uh, obtain data sets, which uh, are now truly becoming uh, big data uh, with current individual data sets reaching up to 4 million cells now, and thereby aggregations of these data sets are uh, reaching many more. Um, so given this technological advancement and this opportunities, um, several consortia, um, for foremost also the, the lifetime and the human cell atlas have attempted to pro generate large scale atlases um, of healthy uh, organs and also with diseased contexts, as, as for example, in lifetime. Um, and these 
atlases should give an image of or a view of what such a healthy organ looks like. Uh, within the TICE lab, we've been uh, very focused, among other things, on, on lung uh, data where I've been involved. Um, amongst other things, there have been uh, two publications of a mouse lung and a human lung as, um, atlas to give an idea of how these uh, how these organs look on the transcriptomic level at the single cell um, on a single cell basis. Now, we are not the only uh, people who've been involved in generating atlases like this um, of, of mouse and human lungs. In fact, there are many, many data sets now available out there which provide you some form of information of what a, a human lung, in this case, atlas looks like. Um, these studies are um, all include healthy data, um, and some also include uh, various disease states. Um, but the healthy, let's say, the, the healthy samples in this, none of these include more than, let's say, approximately 30 individuals. Um, but have one unique way of, of looking at a particular, um, at looking at the human lung. Uh, that may be due to differences in sample types, whether these are deceased donor lungs, or whether these are biopsies, or even bronchoalveolar lavage samples. Um, they sample unique parts of the lung, and sometimes these, these unique parts may just be also different locations. Let's say if you take biopsies from, from different areas, uh, whether they are uh, the nose, the airways, or the parenchyma. And therefore, each of these studies has its own, have their own bias. Um, yet, if we want to ask a question of where is a particular gene expressed in the lung, specifically within the recent COVID uh, pandemic, or with the current pandemic, I'm not, not just recent, um, there have been a lot of interesting questions around uh, the entry factors, let's say, for what allows SARS-CoV to get into the uh, into the lung. Um, we want to know maybe which cells express those. And so we need one central location or one central place to query this rather than a whole host of individual studies. Therefore, it's crucial to kind of put all of these together to build one reference. Now, that sounds easy enough and, and great, you know, well-defined, but actually, it's not quite as easy as it sounds. So let's just take one of these data sets, uh, one that we were involved in, um, one of the, the earlier um, publications of the lung of a, of a lung cell atlas in Nature Medicine 2019. And if we uh, portray here a UMAP embedding where every dot is a single cell uh, and color this by the donors from, from which these cells came. You can see quite a bit of donor diversity, uh, not necessarily a lot of donor mixing, which you might expect is, is not unexpected, uh, which you might expect given that donors are genetically diverse. Um, and if we then look at kind of the cell type annotation with hindsight, because all of these donors were analyzed and were, were labeled, uh, the cells were labeled, um, we can find that, for example, just looking at macrophages, these are present at different places in this UMAP embedding. And if we go back, these are clearly separated by donors. Um, this type of separation, while potentially being due to uh, genetic uh, differences, is also due to technical aspects um, of the fact that there are three different data sets within this particular publication. Um, and so this makes it very difficult to analyze this data going further. Um, we may want to understand commonalities between donors, and therefore, um, if we want to query this particular data set, we will find uh, gene expression within macrophages at many different places. So to remove this donor effect, or to move this donor effect, rather more this batch effect between the individual donors, um, there are many methods out there. And these are just kind of a few of them that we've taken a look at. Um, and of, as you might expect, these all produce different results. So let's take a look at a couple of them. If we just kind of sample a few of these and see what happens if we apply uh, data integration or here batch effect correction, uh, based on SCGen, Harmony, and Desk, we see three very distinct results. And as you can see from the three, uh, the one on the very right might not be something that you expect. Some weird things are happening there given kind of these lines. So let's ignore that for a second. Um, but the other two cases, if we then color again by cell type, we find that, for example, the macrophage examples we were looking at before um, are represented differently here again. In the top case, we have a very distinct cluster of human macrophages. And the bottom, these are overlapping with other cell states. And while you may at first think that, OK, these distinct cluster might be more meaningful, um, maybe there are, there are transitions between, let's say, macrophages and recruited cells, such as you know, monocytes and monocyte-derived macrophages. Um, so it's very difficult to say whether one is necessarily better than the other. Um, and deciding on which integration method to use in this manner is very, very uh, very difficult and very time consuming. And for this reason, 
uh, we decided to formalize what successful batch integration or successful data integration means. Um, conceptually, uh, you can imagine that if you have cells from different batches, you probably don't want them to be separated in this manner. Instead, you would prefer them to be mixed across batches, um, given that we want to remove this effect between individual batches of cells. Normal single cell data is a little bit more complicated, um, where we have different distinct cell types. So again, here we would like cell types uh, not to be separate, so cell types to be separated uh, and not to be kind of separated by batch predominantly and then within batch only separated by cell type. So instead, the image should look somewhat more like this, where we separate clearly uh, by cell type and not at all by batch anymore. These four images represent approximately two concepts uh, of data integration evaluation. On the one hand, we have batch removal. This is the removal of batch effects that I meant before. And on the other side, we want to conserve biological variants. Now, you might imagine that these two facets are actually somewhat uh, in balance because optimal batch removal means uh, if all cells were mapped to one single spot uh, on, on any kind of embedding, this would remove all biological variance conservation and therefore high batch removal may necessitate a low biological variance conservation. Um, these are, however, these are the two aspects that have been previously used to evaluate um, integrated data sets. However, there are more complicated, the more complex aspects to single cell data, uh, such as, for example, continuous phenotypes or variation on the gene level, which we might want to also model um, when we are assessing whether a method was successful at removing batch effects but conserving biological variation. So what we set out to do is to formalize this process and apply this to a lot of different integration tasks. Uh, for that, we took these 16 methods that I introduced before briefly, and we applied this to 13 different integration tasks. Because there is no optimal way to pre-process your single cell data, um, given a particular batch integration method, or this is not kind of compared in detail, usually we also included pre-processing decisions. For example, should you select highly variable genes before integrating your data? Should you scale your data? This is kind of Z-scoring. Um, and then, you know, we have, we did this for all these 13 integration tasks and have sub subsequently applied um, all the 16 methods you see here on the left. Um, of course, we have to take into account that data integration methods typically can output different uh, formats of the data. While some methods output a corrected feature space, uh, that being, for example, corrected gene expression data, or what we also did for attack data is corrected um, windows, uh, gene activity, or peak matrices. Other methods, some of which overlap, only output um, embeddings. So here we don't uh, no longer get a corrected version of the individual features of the input data, but rather we get a, a low dimensional representation of the cells where we still understand relative distances uh, between cells um, after they are corrected for batch effects, but we no longer get the corrected version of the individual gene expression, for example. And then other methods, again, only output corrected graphs where we lose the clear distance metric in the embedding but we have a relationship which we can use between cells to let's say cluster the data in a batch corrected manner. After applying all of this and getting different, uh, different kind of integrations out, we used a suite of 14 integration metrics which measure both the removal batch effects, the conservation of cell type labels, but then also three metrics for label free conservation to assess whether cell cycle variants, for example, is still conserved after batch integration, whether highly variable genes overlap or whether we still find trajectories that we found before integration in per batch in the integrated batch object. And we also evaluated whether the methods are scalable and usable. What that typically looked at uh, like in our results is that here we have one example, uh, one integration method, which produces an embedding output given this pictogram with highly variable gene selection and without scaling. We then calculated an overall score of this, which is made up of two partial scores, one score for batch correction and one score for bioconservation, which we weighted 60-40 towards bioconservation, being the more important feature for us. Um, these scores are made out of individual metrics, uh, which measure different aspects of correcting for batch effects and for bioconservation. And then we applied this throughout um, all different versions of features, uh, feature inputs of scaling uh, and for all different methods. And these results are actually applied directly to the case of the lung cell atlas. So here we took uh, six of the um, integration of the data sets, which I showed you previously, and integrated all of these uh, 
to with different methods to show that ScanVI, which is a uh, deep learning based method and a bit conditional variational autoencoder um, by the Yosef lab performed top in our particular um, in our particular case. So we proceeded with ScanVI to try to generate this integrated lung cell atlas. In our integrated lung cell atlas, we spent a lot of effort in curating individual data sets to ensure we get as broad a representation as possible of what a healthy lung looks like across different biased views of uh, healthy lungs. And we came up in total uh, with 46 data sets uh, with 445 individuals, 673 samples and 2.2 million cells in total. Now, this is the extended, we split up this data set into a core reference and an extended atlas. The extended atlas includes also diseased samples uh, and anything we could collect, which we can kind of understand as representing lung data. The core reference is a subset of 14 data sets with over 100 individuals, which we spent a lot more uh, effort on specifically harmonizing and re-annotating. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So what we did specifically for the core reference, we ensured that all data sets were processed in a somewhat similar manner uh, using raw data processing pipelines, which we distributed to all the contributors um, and uh, using best practices, previously published best practices um, for normalization and processing these data sets. Um, this is, I should mention, uh, the work of a PhD student, a very talented PhD student in the group, uh, Lisa Sikama, who, who is doing a lot of this work with me. And, um, the a second aspect, which we paid a lot of attention to, which uh, was strongly pushed by Alexander Misharin and Martin Navain, who are the uh, heads of the uh, Human Cell Atlas Lung Seed Network and the European, European equivalent DiscoVare, who are strongly involved in this project as well. Um, we ensured that metadata were harmonized so we could analyze uh, subsequently what is in this integrated atlas. For this specifically, it's important that we uh, created a hierarchical set of cell annotations where you have different hierarchies of resolutions of cell annotations uh, at in, in total five different levels. And each of the contributing data sets were mapped to this hierarchical annotation to have a consistent set of labels. Similarly, uh, we harmonized sample metadata and mapped each sample to a coordinate along the lung axis going from nose to parenchyma uh, and encoded this as a value between zero and one. In total, the core reference has substantial variance. And here I just show the uh, composition. So different cell types within each sample. And this is over, uh, I think over hundred samples here that I'm showing you, 160 samples. Um, and you can kind of see a very distinct difference between uh, nasal samples, airway samples, and parenchymal samples in terms of their cell type composition, where we have, for example, much more airway epithelial cells and here much more alveolar epithelial cells in comparison. So the di diversity among these samples in terms of their cell type composition is quite strong, um, hence making the batch integration task fairly complicated, uh, given that differences between these, these samples are biological as well as technical. Here, um, we've, we then, once we had this integrated atlas, we could see a, a clear distinction of, of course, immune cells, epithelial cells, stroma, and, and endothelial cells as the four main compartments. Um, but that's not really sufficient to say whether this is, you know, this is a harmonized and, and good version of the integrated atlas. So what we did is we performed iterative clustering within this atlas to obtain a hierarchical cellular structure. And what that means is we are trying to understand whether we find consistent representations of cellular identity with on our integrated atlas, which may not have been similarly present in the individual atlases, or to assess whether actually we are just recovering what was already there in individual atlases or whether we can find more. And so specifically, once we had these clusters, we can now check whether within these clusters, we are actually just recovering what was there in the individual data sets, um, or whether we are finding disagreements between the original data sets based on their labels. And this is possible because of the um, harmonized label sets, which we gave. What we used here is, is Shannon entropy. So this is just the cell label entropy as we're calling it. And you can then, we can kind of highlight which in which clusters there is a stronger disagreement of labels by the individual parties that contributed these. Um, specifically, um, taking one example of which had a very high label entropy, 
we can find that if we subcluster regions with high label entropy, uh, or just look at these, these regions with high label entropy, we still find disagreements between different cell states. For example, here in this cluster, we have dendritic cells, macrophages, and monocytes all clustered together. Uh, these are the original cell type annotations by the data sets. And when we look at this cluster in more detail, uh, we can kind of, based on marker gene expression, which is consistent across all data sets, re-annotate what we would give them as DC dendritic cell two labels, um, macrophages, and potentially a subcluster of DC one plus migratory DCs. Um, and so here we can see that there is disagreements between individual data sets, and this is somewhat understandable uh, because when a data set is generated, it is not generated with necessarily the uh, goal to perfectly characterize every single cell in that data set but rather there is usually a particular research question that means there's a focus of that data set and therefore also fo more focus typically on the annotation. Uh, that is one of the, the aspects which we have to take into account for why maybe these labels don't necessarily agree. The other aspects are that for rare cells specifically, even though individual data contributors may know that these cells are there, they're very difficult to pull apart without having sufficient representation of these rare cells across the data set. So, this exercise showed us that we actually need to re-annotate the entire uh, lung cell atlas, integrated lung cell atlas. And as we are not necessarily experts in lung cells, uh, this was annotated by uh, consensus annotation of six experts within uh, the human cell atlas lung seed network and also the DiscoVair consortium, the European equivalent, and there's a lot of overlap between the two. I just want to at this point to thank those uh, six experts specifically uh, in the bottom here. Um, and what that led to is a re-annotation of the whole thing with over 40, uh, 58 sorry, cell identities. And now given that we have this hierarchical annotation, we can start assessing whether the initial annotations that were given were actually just as a lower resolution, as you might expect, let's say if you have rare cell states um, that you cannot annotate in your individual data set, um, um, but instead give a higher lower resolution label um, for example, just rare, rare epithelial cells instead of ionocytes, for example. And this would be um, an under annotated cell as we would classify it, or whether the annotations that were in the original data sets were actually misannotated, meaning they came from a different clade in this tree of hierarchical annotations that we have. So looking through, this is kind of what we find across our 58 cell annotations, that there are actually rather few cell identities that are consistently correctly annotated, um, given that we have some trust in our re-annotation based on the consensus of individual of experts. And just to give a, an example of what this means, um, when we look specifically at endothelial cells here, we have a lot of blue, which are under annotated cells. And this is because endothelial cells are typically uh, annotated just as endothelial cells rather than the labels which we could give them now that we have a stronger representation of this, for example, as uh, systemic venous endothelial cells, et cetera. And so a lot of endothelial cells were classified as under annotated predominantly and across these data sets with very few actually being, uh, a few also being misannotated. On the other hand, we have cases where there's a large misannotation of data sets. And this is specifically true for cell states which are transitionary. Um, such as uh, proliferating alveolar macrophages, uh, which often were only met labeled as macrophages rather than alveolar, for example, as well. Um, or between goblet and club cells in the epithelium, there is a, uh, is a continuous cell phenotype. And so a lot of these were sometimes misannotated as club versus goblet. Um, and that is, a, is kind of a difficult uh, decision because there's a lot of kind of still open questions on where the boundary between these two cell states actually lies or cell types lies. Now, now that we have this reannotation, we can actually look at generating consistent markers uh, or marker genes for these populations, which are consistent across 14 um, or 46 different data sets. And so here specifically, we can now, uh, we've used a dual uh, strategy of looking at within compartment markers. So let's say comparing to all immune cells and markers across the entire data set to characterize these populations. And we assume that these, uh, given that these marker genes are consensus across a lot of data sets, they should better generalize to further data sets and therefore um, reduce the issues with re-annotation or annotation of newer data sets given a, a consistent set of markers in this way. So now I've told you a lot about how we generated uh, this atlas. 
and also uh, the detailed analysis that we put into creating such an atlas and ensuring its quality. Um, but how can we now actually use this atlas um, to inform either for the research or to do that analysis for us in the future? It's going to be very difficult to every time you have a new lung data set now say, oh, look at these markers. I'm going to cluster all my cells um, and generate exactly the same cell type populations uh, that we might would like to, uh, like to find. And so what we would like to have is, let's say, this lung cell, human lung cell atlas, this integrated lung cell atlas that we've generated. And we would just want to map on top a new data set to assess, is this like, which cell type do I have in my new data set? Um, this has recently been made possible by a couple of tools, uh, one of which also developed within the TICE lab called SC Arches, which is led by Molot Falahi, a uh, PhD student in the group. And specifically what is done here um, is that if you have a new data set, or if you want to create a new reference, you typically have, like, or also the models that we use, are conditional variational autoencoders, which means that here you kind of take uh, each node in blue is a, or this on the left side is a gene uh, expression value. You take one cell um, and encode it in this manner um, to project onto a lower dimensional space, which is this in the middle right here. And then it's projected back out and assessed that the input and outputs should be as similar as possible. This is also true for the model that we use in the end uh, scan VI, or there are a few more intricacies that I won't go into now. However, if you have a new data set in this particular setting, you would need to retrain that entire model and generate these kind of the, the batch covariates for, for a new batch covariate. To facilitate that process, um, what SC Arches does is it adds just a little bit extra to that model. So it performs architectural surgery, which is where SC Arches comes from, and allows you to have these query labels, the, the new query data set labels, which is the batch covariate for the new label, and only train how this maps to the originally um, present model in the data. And so with this, we can then generate a mapping of a new data set onto the already existing one with only training a small adapter sequence here, rather than retraining the entire model. Importantly, that means that our original embedding and our original clustering does not change while mapping a new data set on top. And we don't need to redo the entire process that we've just done before, but we can actually use the original embedding and the labels to understand what is in our new data. So how does that work in practice going away from the, the, the theoretical conversation I'm, I'm having now? Um, if we are now taking our integrated human lung cell atlas um, and there's a, we take a new data set, which was uh, still unpublished and, and giving us, uh, given to us by collaborators from uh, from the Teichmann lab, um, we can now map this on top, right? And you can see here a, a distinct difference between kind of, or the distinct in, in colors, that the healthy lung, the new data, um, only healthy lung data, and the original um, human lung cell atlas in gray. If we look at this on top in terms of cell type annotations, we can find that um, actually we, we find kind of quite nice overlap of individual uh, cells from the new data set uh, mapped on top, at least on the UMAP representation here, on top of the existing labels that we have in the atlas. Now, this joint um, embedding that we've now created based on the mapping on top, uh, we can use to actually project information from the original uh, from the original human integrated lung cell atlas to the new data sets. And that's done in, in our case uh, by a KNN classifier, which is mapped on top, uh, which is basically using the joint embedding. Um, with this mapping or this projection of labels, we get also an assessment of uncertainty of these labels. And so you can see here, just looking at the same UMAP representation, that the darker the cells, the lower the uncertainty. For a lot of these cells, we are actually pretty confident uh, at mapping labels from the original um, atlas to the new, new data set. There are just some uh, higher uncertainties and specifically at like kind of transitionary states or transitionary regions in this UMAP between um, identified cell states. And also, if we look very carefully here, there are regions uh, which have not been actually populated by the original atlas, um, but these cells are in the new data. And so they get a very high uncertainty score, uh, which also indicates that potentially new cell states within the data. So if we then take all the new data sets and assess um, how confident were we with generating the labels, we can find uh, 
uh, given the original labels, which were mapped, uh, harmonized also with our labels in the integrated atlas, we can find in general, we have a very high proportion of correct labeling with a few cases here where we have incorrect labels or unknown labels is very strong. And these are actually all cases of cells which are absent in the original reference. Um, here, megakaryocytes, there are only 11 cells, meaning it's very difficult to, assess, to give a, them high unknown cell, uh, unknown scores. But in the other cases where we have actually even just 42 cells and chondrocytes here, in this case, and erythrocytes being what I highlighted on the left in the plot here, we can clearly identify which region, uh, which cells are actually more interesting to look into in more detail um, based on the uncertainty scores or this unknown label that we're projecting. Now, if you remember the uh, accuracy that I showed you before of misannotated and underannotated cells um, in the original data sets, this mapping of new labels is actually very competitive with manual reannotation of individual data sets, given that here we are transferring labels from a, uh, a curated integrated object, which has the ability to map uh, to label even rare cell states which might be underrepresented in the new data set. If I were to re-annotate that, the new data set alone, I would find much harder to separate these rare cell states uh, from other, ce um, other cells in the original, in the data. And therefore, uh, my rare cell annotations very likely would not necessarily be of the highest quality. And so therefore, we believe that actually analyzing your new data set by just mapping a projection is uh, a very good alternative to complete manual reannotation. Although I, we would suggest that you also look at the uncertainty in this to to figure out regions of of like to pay more attention to for further analysis. What we've done now is not just use this with one data set, but actually uh, with the extended atlas that I introduced before, we mapped 2.2 million cells in total, um, or an additional 1.6 million cells to the first 600,000 um, to extend this atlas in this way. And we actually find, this is still work in progress, it's rather preliminary, but we find that this appears to work at first glance in, in terms of where the cells, which are in red here, map on the atlas, except in a few cases. So for example, one of the data sets I can show just in the bottom here, which is this kind of green blob, um, had a very few gene overlap with the original um, atlas, um, with the original atlas uh, because of probably different genomes. And so, if you have less than 66% or 60% gene overlap, then it doesn't work quite as well as you might like. Well, in other cases, it seems that even nu single nucleus data um, maps to the single cell reference very well using SE arches, um, but we're yet to kind of do a more detailed analysis on in which cases there are more limitations and in which cases this works very well. So to summarize uh, what I've just been telling you about, um, we have this SCIB pipeline for benchmarking data integration, which you can use to evaluate how well different methods integrate your, your data, or you can also use to compare your new integration method um, to others on the same data sets. The integrated lung cell atlas, I've only been able to tell you a little bit about this so far, um, enables a consensus definition of cellular identity, uh, gives a strong recovery of rare cell types as well, uh, what I didn't manage to get into was contextualizing GWAS results. We can focus where there are relevant hits and allows rapid analysis of new data sets. Um, with SE Arches, we can use this reference atlas um, to facilitate new data set analysis. And what we're building at the moment is an FC Arches web server to map this data onto the human lung cell atlas just by uploading your data to a web portal and getting the, um, the projected labels back. Uh, an open question, which I like putting out there, which we still haven't solved necessarily yet, is how we ensure that the specific biological process is well represented in the atlas. There is always some give and take in terms of that we will never get the perfect representation of the underlying biology. And so if we're interested in one process, maybe we still have to file a little bit on the gene sets that we use for integration. And finally, I want to give a shout out um, to uh, an extension that we're working on at the moment um, for multimodal data sets. Um, so specifically, we have a NeurIPS competition that is ongoing to evaluate method where we're kind of asking people to integrate multimodal data sets uh, with three different tasks. And we would uh, we are evaluating this on a large scale. Um, this might be interesting to anyone who also was yesterday present at the epigenomics, the Skog Epigenomics Workshop. Um, and there are prizes to be won, so that should be quite exciting. 
Um, and the, the deadlines there, I think, are, are late November, basically early December, when we're looking to evaluate all the results. But there's still, you know, very much competition ongoing, and so you can you join if you'd like to. Um, and finally, I'd like to acknowledge all the people who uh, were involved in various part of this project. I mentioned Lisa already, who is a strong push behind the integrated lung cell atlas. Mar and Daniel, Michaela, and Luke. Uh, and of course, uh, Fabian, as well as uh, Maria Colome Tache's group for benchmarking data integration, and Marta, excuse me. Um, and of course, all, all the people who contributed even unpublished data sets to the integrated lung cell atlas to bring together this community effort um, uh, Sasha Misharin, um, Herbert Schiller, uh, Kirsten Meyer, Pascal, uh, Nick Banovich, John Kropsky, Elizabeth Duong, and Martin Navine, who have enabled us to grow to these huge numbers of cells. Thank you. Malte, amazing talk, amazing work. I think whenever we think about reproducing or, you know, clinically or translationally using these single cell data sets, that's exactly the work that has to be done. And it's so, so beautiful to see uh, how you guys did that. Um, there has been a bit of discussion already in the chat. I, I won't be able to pick up all of that, I guess, um, since some of the questions you asked in there might be answered already. If you still have a question to Malte, please give me a cue in the chat or raise your hand and then I will call you one after the other. I think there's a lot of discussion. Um, uh, let's have at least 10, 15 minutes now. And we start with Daniel. Please unmute, um, turn your video on and ask him. Hi, thanks for the great talk. I would have a question, sorry if I missed this, is you said you also had like the C state data in there for the cell atlas. So I was wondering how scaling is affecting like this proper integration of the C state data in terms of removing potential biological signals in there. And also regarding how integration of like the C state data into the healthy cell atlas might look like and how well this works in terms of like scaling and, and uh, removal of biological signals? That's a super good question. I, I think, um, so the difficulty always between conserving biological variation and removing batch effects is, is not trivial. Um, we haven't, the evaluation of the integration methods were done only on healthy data. So I can't speak specifically of to how scaling affects disease variation in particular. However, disease variation, just like any other biological variation, uh, should be like somewhat affected similarly, I would assume. Uh, and that's what we do find, um, and this is in the paper, which is hopefully out, uh, which is in press at the moment, so hopefully is, is out very soon, um, for benchmarking data integration, is that actually, so scaling is one of those things that kind of shifts your balance between focusing more on biological variance conservation and removal of batch effects. If you have strong batch effects in your data, and these strong batch effects might be from cross-species integration, for example, if you do want to do that, um, or aspect like single nucleus plus single cell data integration, then scaling might be necessary to get that alignment to work well. However, that always comes at a penalty. Scaling typically does remove biological variation specifically around rarer cell states um, and cell states which are not shared across different uh, batches. And so in general, um, if you are worried about disease variation, uh, I would avoid scaling yeah. if possible. But the other aspect actually for disease variation, which we've done so far, which I think this might actually be the right way on top, is to map the disease variation on top of the healthy, generate this integrated atlas where you have to make all these decisions on scaling, et cetera, um, first on healthy data, map the others on top, and then you already have a regularized representation of or a regularization of this batch effect removal. Yep. So you're a little bit more, uh, you should conserve more disease variation there. Thanks. I guess there are more questions. Please raise your hand or give me a cue in the chat <clears throat> until people do. So I have one question to the first part of the talk. When you integrate your data set, and let's say you have a data set that goes through the pre-processing seamlessly, right? Can you still fail on, on, on integration with, with the other data sets? And if so, how do we identify that? Yeah, so um, pre-processing is completely separate from this. So you can fail at any stage. <laughs> um, and so, um, Typically, so I, I didn't go into too much detail on the individual metrics which we used to evaluate um, pre-process, sorry, integration, but I can just, let me just see if I can go back to that slide a little bit. Um, so basically we identify um, failure of integration based on these 14 metrics. Um, whether there are, here I've only kind of highlighted three of them specifically and then two classes of these. 
Um, but essentially, we identify failures of data integration by having pre-processed each individual batch separately, given those batches labels, and then, for example, um, perform trajectory inference within one batch. If the trajectory that you find within one batch is no longer clear when you have that same trajectory across four batches and you integrate those, that's a failure of the data integration rather than a failure of the pre-processing. And by this single batch to integrated batch comparison, you can always keep doing that, right? Uh, and so that's what we're doing in these metrics is essentially as evaluating different aspects uh, of biological complexity we would like to have represented in the data, whether those are clusters, whether those are cell types only present in one batch, uh, whether those are trajectories, for example, whether that is cell cycle information. Um, and always assessing if it's still there in one batch, uh, that what was initially in one batch, if it's still there in the integrated object. Very interesting. Thanks. Hey, uh, since people don't, uh, ah, there's a question by Faye. Hi, Malta. Um, thanks for the great talk. I'm just curious, or I don't know whether uh, you mentioned, mentioned it, but I missed it, but does the um, SC archers give you an output, um, like a load, uh, sort of like a corrected feature space, or is it just a um, low dimensional embedding in this case? So SCRHs uh, will give you, depending on the method, it, it gives you different things. Um, so if you, for example, use ScanVI method um, that we've used also, uh, typically, so you can get both, but they would recommend, they recommend also in, in their paper that you use the low dimensional embedding. If you use SC arches with, for example, SC Gen, uh, which is another tool which, which Mo developed in the, in the lab, um, then you get uh, corrected feature expression output because that is what SC Gen gives you. And so it depends on the method. Okay, thank you. Next question by Pia. If possible, also turn the video on Pia so we can have a bit of a real discussion here. Okay. Um, hey, Marta. Thanks a lot for the great talk. Um, okay, this is a bit of a, I think, more philosophical question, I guess, regarding this uh, biological variance conservation, because I, I know that you need to choose like somewhat what you use as a reference, but you showed pretty impressively beforehand with the lung cell atlas that actually a lot of the single data set annotation is wrong, or say, like just because of the lack of... Um, like complexity and um, cell type number that you can't pick up a lot of cell types um, or trajectories and so on and that only this integrated reference atlas can give it to you so I'm wondering like yeah how much do you think such type of bias or wrong annotation in the initial data set will contribute to choosing maybe an, an not optimal method for the integration um, that's a great question. Um, so the cell type labels that we used for evaluating the integration were in at least half of the cases regenerated by us. Um, and so this is something we were quite sensitive to initially, where we reanalyze individual data sets to make sure that the marker genes that we were using were consistently used. So even if we gave one wrong annotation, we gave the same wrong annotation every time. Um, and that would kind of, you know, then make the problem only on the labeling itself. There are a couple of instances where that's not the case, uh, where we couldn't re-annotate everything, and that might be an issue. Um, there is definitely something where we could have annotated more deeply. So, for example, in the lung um, atlas task within the data integration manuscript, which is not the same as what I presented later, um, there is, for example, B cells have a lot more diversity. Um, because the original annotation is just says B cells, but actually we find multiple clusters of the same label. So we could do better. I think overall the ranking is still fairly robust to this, uh, given that we did a re-annotation on a couple of cases, though. Thanks. Thanks, Malte. Dahlia is next. Hi, Malte. Thanks for a great talk. Really interesting. Um, I was just curious um, when you do the projection of new data sets to, to your atlas, is it interesting to do a subsampling of the atlas uh, or is it possible um, to just make the computational faster? So this is uh, it's a great question. So this is actually one of the things which is a huge benefit of this projection. Um, you don't need the original atlas uh, data at all to make the projection. So why we are generating a web server of this as well is that you can just take the trained model 
And then all your retraining is how the new data maps on top. So you don't need any of the original um, data. You, there, that means there's no need for subsampling. It's just as fast. This is way, way, way faster than if you perform a reintegration of everything, especially if you're using GPU architecture. And so this is why um, it's so nice that we can just map on top. Um, we are still, I mean, we've tested quite extensively the limitations of mapping on top versus retraining. And so far it's all looked good, but it's a little bit too good to be true that it works all the time perfectly, right? There are some limitations that if you map too many things on top of a, an unfinished reference, we might want to update the original reference. Um, but essentially, yeah, it's, it's very fast. You don't need to subsample. That's really great. Thanks. <laughs> Interesting. Andre, you're next. Yeah, hello, Martin. A uh, very short question. Is there projects to make this to make these models and this approach available to other organs like pancreas or liver? We are current. So pancreas or liver are not specifically started right now by us. Uh, there are efforts, I'm sure, within the human cell atlas, which are going in these directions. We are working also, for example, on the retina um, to to with with Nacho, who uh, might be in the audience. Uh, so Ignacio Ibarra, who in, in the TICE lab, he's working a lot on trying to make this available. Um, this project has taken nearly uh, a year and a half, two years. Uh, so it's it's something that's not super straightforward. But now we know how it's done. We think we can scale this up at a much larger level. So we are starting to try to apply this to different organs. Uh, so yes, um, this will happen. And uh, that's fully within like what we intend to do next. Great. Thanks a lot, everybody. Um, there are some questions in the chat. Um, I don't go over them now. If you still have questions to Malte, please just write an email to him. Um, I know he, he will answer all of your more detailed questions, I guess, um, which might be also in the chat. Thanks, everybody, for coming in. Thanks for answering questions. Malte, thanks again for the great talk. Thanks to um, Nina, Anna, and Marco for <clears throat> setting this all up here and uh, running the seminar series um, bi-weekly. Remember that we will be back in two weeks' time um, with another great talk on things and aspects. I wish you a great Friday and a good weekend and um, see you all next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.